This is part two of our conversation with William Goldman. His new book is called Which Lie Did I Tell? More Adventures in the Screen Trade. He mentioned that obituaries generally, if you have won an Oscar, will mention that as they try to recap and celebrate a life lived. Bill Goldman knows, knows that when the time comes to write his obituary, the first line will be... Academy Award winner. Oh, and the second line will be the famous phrase you wrote. Nobody knows anything. Right. That's a phrase that caught on out there. It really did. Why is that? Because, because it's true. And it came out of this book, Adventures it, in the Screen. It came out of Adventures in the Screen. It's because Hollywood is so filled with hype and lies. The fact is no one has the... I'll tell you a quick story this year. Recently a movie opened that was a total wipeout disaster. Cost over $100 million. Uh, the studio tested terribly. The studio executives who greenlit it were about to walk the plank. It was Stuart Little. It was a gigantic See, success. See, that's the story they're, you told me. I they're making remember. the yeah. sequel. The fact is they have no idea until people come on a Friday or don't come on a Friday if a movie is going to work. They have more sense on a sequel, of course. Yeah. But on a first time out, they have no idea. But they can't say that because they're all making millions of dollars a year for knowing what they're and doing. And you're saying that no amount of market testing, no, they, no amount of focus groups, no amount of anything will tell you whether a movie is going to be a hit with the American public. This will drive you mad, but I believe this is true. Very simply, people go to see hits because they want to see that movie. They don't go to see flops because they don't want to see that movie. It's as simple as that. And the problem Hollywood has is they can't figure out why. If they could figure out why, they wouldn't give Kevin Costner... $125 million to make The Postman. Studios are in business for only one very, very good reason, to stay in business, to show a profit to their stockholders. There was a quote from Michael Eisner. I'll get it wrong in one of the papers. Uh, I am not in business for art. I am business to make money for my stockholders. Absolutely correct. That's his job. He's the head of his studio. Well, is there a constant battle between art and commerce in desperately, Hollywood? Desperately, desperately. More now than ever, but now... Commerce is just killing the other guy. Commerce is basically so big now. All right, I want to talk to you about movies and about writing scripts and, okay. and about the movies that you have written and, and about how difficult it is and what goes into the craft and how do you start and how fast it is and all of that. But first, take a look at this. This is a recent interview I did with uh, Roman Polanski in Paris and what he said to me about why there are so many bad movies, followed by... A little note on screenwriting by Martin Scorsese. Roll tape. And sometimes I literally stand on the set, close my eyes, and, and trying to, to remember how I was imagining that scene before the casting, before the arguing with the producers, before I, uh, talking about money, before uh, uh, hiring the actors, etc. And, and, and I, you know, sometimes I like fleeting... Uh, uh, image, you know, but the, the bi bi bits and pieces are there. When you're doing the film, you don't, as everybody one knows, don't do it in continuity. You do it in pieces. You just do a little piece. And there are so many elements that distract you from the that main line that when you put it all together, it's not what it's supposed to be. Russians always look great, even in mediocre films. Everybody is always happy. The, the, the tragic moment, it's the rough cut when you put it all together for the first time. You know, usually the director goes to rest for a few, few weeks, couple of weeks, and leaves it with the editor to put it all together. Sometimes he goes to, you know, to a clinic. Then he returns, then he, he sits, and the projection starts, and that is the moment when he wants to hang himself. Become, um, because almost inevitably it looks terrible, you see. With all my experience, I've been doing it for years and years, I know that the moment of the rough cut will be rougher than the rough cut itself, you see. So it's, that's why it's so difficult. First of all, you need, you need the story, you need the script Find to be the there. You need the script to be right. there. You need it to be on the page in terms of the emotion and in terms of uh, something with which the audience can empathize in terms of characters. You need the audience to care about somebody. Okay, that's one thing. So we've been taking over the years, we've been pushing, we've pushing the envelope on that, though, over the years with Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, and uh, particularly Raging Bull, 
and even uh, Goodfellas and uh, Casino. So you're pushing the edge there. How much can you care for a person if he's this bad or she's that bad, you know? And can you still care? There's some yeah. out there I know can still care, so that's pretty good. Okay. Now, let's see if we can push a little more. Now, the, the only thing for me, though, is that uh, uh, that's one thing. That's got to be on the page. But then for me, it's the literally the imagining, imagining of um, shots, one shot being cut to the other and the emotional and psychological impact of that cut and the movement of that cut. In other words, uh, two shots together, two moving shots together, create another movement altogether in your mind that isn't there. Okay, the two perspectives. One from Polanski about how movies are so bad and, mm -hmm. and, and why and, and how nobody sets out to make a bad movie. All of a sudden, you, you, know, you say, holy, you try to remember what it was I started out to do. Take me through the screenwriter's eyes as to how you go about writing a movie. Well, I wish there was a way to do it. Like, oh, there's, there's a great line of Billie Jean King's, if it was easy, everyone would do it. <laughs> yes. You conceive, you, each individual person, there's no right or wrong way to tell a story. Movie screenwriting is only about storytelling on film. It's not like writing a novel or a poem or a play. The camera takes in everything so quickly. You've got to get on with it, on with it, on with it. When you write a story for film, when you write a movie, you decide where does it begin and where does it end. So if I begin and end here, somebody else might begin and end there. There's no right or wrong way. What you have to do is go with what you sense is the story you want to tell and try and tell it. One of the things Polanski said is you lose perspective. Gordon Willis, one of the great cameramen of all time, the Godfathers, all the, a lot of the great Woody Allens, said his greatest skill is not his camera. His greatest skill is he remembers the movie they were going to make before they started. Because what happens when a movie starts is, what happens if the star won't come out of his or her trailer? What happens if you don't have eight days to shoot the sequence? You have three. And all of a sudden you think, what happens if somebody who wasn't supposed to be terrific is terrific and you want more of him? So he can, And all of a sudden, instead of going this way, you go that way. And the movie is in terrible trouble. You, uh, you, you also make the point that to make a good movie, it all has to come together. Everybody. it's You've got to have the music, you've got to have the actors, you've got to have the right story. I'm not a great fan of directors. I think they're wildly overrated, but they're very helpful. And very, I mean, they're obviously, I mean, my hero is Ingmar Bergman who, and Billy Wilder, who are great, great, great directors, as well as great writers. But two of the best people ever for me, George Ray Hill and Elia Kazan, said the same thing to me. They said... The first day of rehearsal, your fate is sealed, by which they meant if you have cast it properly, if you have cast the crew properly, if you've got the right cameraman and the right editor and the right this and, and you've got the right script, you have a chance for something of quality. If you've made a crucial mistake in any of those phases, you may have a hit, but it won't be very good. It won't be very good. So what happens, is, I mean, obviously, I was in a movie recently with two friends. We talked about it over coffee afterwards. I was talking about the script. The woman who was an actress was talking about the acting. The man who was a director was talking about the directing. Scorsese, who's a brilliant visual talent, would have to think that way. Would have to think that way. One, but once you, everybody needs to have the story right. The reason nobody knows this is because screenwriters are not cute. You do not see them on television shows. You see the director, and one of the things I love is you see the stars who says, yes, I, I wrote my part. And I want to say, <laughs> oh, let me see the script with your handwriting. <laughs> stars think if they change this to a Coke, that's writing the scene. <laughs> Drives you nuts. Drives you, you nuts. You said here that stars write like six-year-olds. Well, <laughs> that, that's not their job. But what happens is they're so insecure. It's very hard to believe that beautiful movie stars are insecure. One of the biggest mistakes any screenwriter can make is to forget that fact. Because they're desperately insecure. They want to be told not that they're wonderful, but that they're perfect. They need that. Well, you also say that stars are not heroes, they're gods. They're gods. And you better write for them. If you want to have a career as a screenwriter, and you don't have to, you better write how divine they are. Would you do that? Well, I have two scripts that I write. I have... <laughs> What I call the first draft, which is many drafts, is the selling version. That's when I want to convince you to give me a hundred million, to give the director a hundred million dollars to make the movie. Then, once the selling version has worked, and you think, oh my God, my friends are going to see this, 
you begin to write what I call the shooting version, where I don't sell as much. In other words, I sell a lot. I try to make For the a pitch. Yeah, I try to make a screenplay as readable as possible. I mean, one of the but you don't think studio executive read scripts, do you? Uh, not as much as they should, no. Yeah. But one of the things that's awful about screenplays is, if you've ever seen a screenplay, for the most part, it has these capital letters and these numbers. Cut to, uh, cut to one, int, studio, day. That's all, that's all. Bill and Charlie are sitting at a table. Well, all those numbers are only there, not for the screenplay, but for later when you're in production. So everybody knows, oh, we're shooting one today, so we need to have a studio, we need to have lights, we need to have a table. Right, 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 right. right. But people don't, one of the things I, I do in the book is I printed some fat, like the zipper scene in something about Mary. Yeah. The great the movie Earth, you love. Oh, I loved it. The great North by Northwest, the crop dusting scene, Nora Ephron's wonderful orgasm scene, Bob Town's great scene. I mean, I print it because you can say, hey, wait a minute, somebody wrote that. There it is. It's on the page. It's not all Jim Cameron. All right. Um, is that why, I mean, but it seems to me that, that I've met at this table a lot of first-rate directors, including some of them that are listed here. Yeah. They're smart. Yep. They're interesting. Yep. They bring a lot to the table. Tremendous amount. Then why are you so down on them? Because as crucial as I think there are six or seven of us that have to be at our best for a movie to be wonderful. Yeah. And one of them is obviously the director. And one of them is obviously... The cinematographer. You know what ever talks about the cinematographer? The first guy who's gotten ink this year was Connie Hall for American Beauty. Right, right. Who did such an... And, and who's an elderly guy. An I elderly remember. guy. And he, you know, I sort of coming back to do something. But, I mean, he's just fabulous. But no, you don't know what he does. Yeah. No, but you don't send him out on a hype tour. Which lie did I tell? Where did that line come from? I was in Las Vegas, and a producer was lying to a lot of people on the phone. One call after another. One call after another. I'll get he, you this star, I'll get you this thing, I can make me this to hear. He right. wanted me to hear because he didn't go to the next room. So being perverse, I picked up Sports Illustrated and just I did not listen. So I'm reading, he's talking, he's talking, and finally he goes, he says, Bill, Bill. And he puts his hand and he says, which lie did I tell? <laughs> and he didn't say out of embarrassment, it was all in the interest of accuracy. He'd forgotten which lie he told and whatever. But they do, they do, because it's the nature of the business. Why do you stay in the business if you have such almost, certainly, almost contempt? I don't have contempt. I love the movie business. It's fabulous. It really is. It's just nutty. And the problem, the reason I write a book like this is because most people get their, enter get their knowledge of Hollywood from hype. They get their knowledge of Hollywood from television shows who want to say how wonderful everything is. And it isn't. And, you, and everybody wants to go in the movie business now, and you better know what it is before you go into battle. Actors that you work with that you admire the most. Let's just take the high road. Oh, I've got so many Clint Eastwood. Because? Because he's so professional. And, and so? Most of the time when you're dealing in the movie business, you're dealing with ego so much because we're all so insecure. Right. And things get crazy and tempers get lost and things are, it's very slow. Like I said, Polanski had a line when he said, you shoot out of sequence. We might shoot your close-up for this right. in March and my close-up in July. And we have to save your suit and my jacket. Right. Um, he's just so pro. Paul Newman, just so pro. Uh, a lot of the Brits, Anthony Hopkins, uh, and Margaret, I, mean, I worked with a lot of people who were just wonderful performers. And what I want, when I'm hired, I want they get my best. And I, one of the things I don't like to be, I screw up shots. I tend to make a mistake. There's a story for me on Princess Bride. Very briefly, Buttercup and Wesley, the hero, are walking through the fire swamp where there are spurts of flame. And in all the drafts of the novel, they walk in, there's a flame spurt, her dress is on fire, right? In all the drafts of the screenplay, they walk in, there's a spurt of flame. We're shooting the scene in London. Whole crew, hundreds of people, smoke machines are going, everything's bleh, it's all the fire swamp, here they come. There's a flame spurt, her dress catches on fire, and I scream, her dress is on fire. Totally destroying the shot. Uh, the producer came over and said, Bill, her dress is supposed to be on fire. 
but it's just I basically don't like being on the set right. because it's I've done the work. I pretty much know the script. I want to get away from it. Princess Bride for you is what? The best thing and the only thing I really like. The only novel I've ever written that I like. And uh, one of the two movies I really like along with Butch Cassidy. Why is that? I don't like my writing. Too bad. You don't like your writing? Do not like it. I'm aware of all my tricks. I'm aware of all my feelings. I know I oversurprise. I know I'm terrified that people will stop watching or reading me. So In what I words, do... You're terrified that one day you'll bore people. Yes. And so I overcompensate by that by doing all kinds Power of tricks. Pyrotechnics of all tricks. kinds. Yes. Well, I know. I'm not surprised by my tricks. I wish I were a fabulous stylist. When I started, I wrote my first novel when I was 24, and all I had, it's all I have now, an ear for dialogue and a sense of story. Here's what surprises me about you. Um, a, I'm surprised you never wanted to direct and you never expand. I really am surprised, and, and I hear it's a, you why. It's a decision I'm glad I made, John. You are. I never, oh no, terrible. Yeah, because, because, just too many pressures, too many different kinds I don't of have the one crucial thing a director needs, I believe, beyond all else, is a sense of camera placement, by which I mean scenes are little short snippets of film that lock into each other, and out of that your story, your scene happens, and your sequence happens, and your movie happens. The way you put the camera is a gift, I think, that the great directors have, which I don't. I mean, they were obviously great. I mean, Scorsese... Uh, Raging Bull was arguably the best movie of the 80s. Right. It was a flop, alas. I wish it had been a huge hit, because that would have changed. See, the interesting thing I'm roaming, American Beauty, what's different about it is it's a huge hit. It's not that different, really, from Ice Storm. But Ice Storm didn't do business. This has done business. That's what's interesting yeah. about that movie. I'll tell you what's interesting in terms of what you point out, and, and it is that uh, David Putnam told you, without the music, Chariot of Fires. That's right. Oh, absolutely. Would not have Well, been. doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You just sit there and it's a turd sitting here. Blah, awful. But you put that music in and it all of a sudden a everything. And... But I think that's true. You can mistell a movie. You can misadvertise. I had a movie uh, called The Princess Bride, which tested that year, number two of all movies of the year, which means it was behind Back to the Future, I think which means it should have done like 150 million, huge hit. It wasn't that. Among other things, the studio that was selling it had no idea how to sell it. They liked the movie. They weren't being evil. They didn't know, was it a comedy? Was it a romance? Was it an action picture? And when you mix genres, you're in trouble. It's very easy to make a bloodbath movie. Let's just kill people. Get a good blood guy, kill a lot of people. Blech, they die. That's, a, that's easy. What's hard is, Butch Cassidy was hard because you're mixing... A little bit of romance, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of violence in a Western. That's harder to do. I didn't set out to write it because it was hard. I didn't know that. But it is. When you're mixing genres, it's tough. Best thing you've ever done is Princess Bride and Butch Cassidy. Yeah, I think so. What's the biggest mistake you ever made? Oh, writing all the presidents, man. Okay. I won an Oscar for it. I would love to. Not... There's that wonderful line of Peter Sellers. Someone said, if you had your life to live over again... What would you do? And he said, I would do exactly what I've done, but I wouldn't have seen the Magus, which is one of the great lines. If you've seen the Magus, I would say I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have done all the presents. But it was just such an unpleasant experience. Yeah. Uh, which... Terrific movie. Swell movie. I haven't seen it in 25 years, but I think it was good. I, I talk to people who've seen it, and I say, how does it hold up? Young kids and stuff. They'll say, it's good. It's good. It's still, you know, because you worry about it being old for them. Guess what is the greatest movie Mr. Goldman has ever seen two words, Gunga Den. Not even, no one in second place. I won't defend that intellectually among a bunch of French auteurists, but that, for me that is. And that was the movie that made the greatest impact. In Why? Me. Oh, because nothing moves me on in life as much as stupid courage. I didn't know that then. There's a moment toward the end when Cary Grant and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Victor McLaughlin are dying, and the British troops are going to get slaughtered, and this dopey little water carrier climbs up on a temple of gold to blow a bugle and save them. And he knew he was going to die when he did it. And I just started to cry. 
and I could still cry, right? I will spare you of that, but it still moved me terribly. When you think about it, you cry. Oh, yeah, but I basically, uh, that kind of thing just moves me to death. I knew when I was writing Butch Cassidy, I was talking about this to somebody, I knew if I could get to the end, I had a moment of stupid courage, which was when they're dying, they don't talk about it. They talk about where they're going to go next. And I thought that was terrific. They don't say, God, you remember when we were doing this? Or, they don't talk about the past. They, they, see, that for me was a neat scene. Because mm. it's not what you think. And I thought it was a legitimate surprise. Very often I'll over surprise just a surprise. I'm surprised, secondly, when you haven't been a director, I haven't even wanted to attempt it. You did try to be an executive producer with the son of yeah. Butch Cassidy, and that didn't work. Didn't work. I'm surprised you have never tried to write a movie an original screenplay about basketball because I did you... I did I wrote one Danny DeVito came to me about it's one of the best and and I wrote a thing I wrote a movie called Low Fives which I really thought had some quality and it was Danny was playing a sleazy basketball coach at a sleazy school in Texas and the dean of the school who was turns out was equally as sleazy as Danny was going to be John Cleese and a gigantic basketball talent they'd found in Africa. And what happened was we had a reading of the script, and it was one of the best experiences of my movie career. I just sat there and I loved it. it I didn't want to shoot it, but I thought, yeah, this works. And the director was going to be Barry Sonnenfeld, and we were about to go, and he got a job for a lot of money, and he took it because he hadn't made a lot of money yet, and things began to fritter away, and it's still owned by Jersey Films. If you want to make it, I really like it. I would love to rewrite it. All right. One more time. The book is called Which Lie Did I Tell by William Goldman, More Adventures in the Screen Trade. John Gregory Dunn, who is a pretty good screenwriter himself, said, if you're thinking of going to film school, don't. Read Which Lie Did I Tell. Instead, it will save you a great deal of money and tell you more about the realities of the picture business than any academic course of study. He has a New York bias that I do not buy into. I like L.A., but beyond that, he is entertaining and, most importantly, right. Again, Bill Goldman. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. I'll tell you a quick story this year. Recently, a movie opened that was a total wipeout disaster. cost over $100 million. Uh, the studio tested terribly. The studio executives who greenlit it were about to walk the plank. It was Stuart Little. It was a gigantic success. See, that's the story they're, you told me. That I they're making remember. the yeah. sequel. The fact is, they have no idea until people come on a Friday or don't come on a Friday if a movie is going to work. They have more sense on a sequel, of course. Yeah. But on a first time out, they have no idea. But they can't say that because they're all making millions of dollars a year for knowing what they're and doing. And you're saying that no amount of market testing, no, they, no amount of focus groups, no amount of anything will tell you whether a movie is going to be a hit with the American public. This will drive you mad, but I believe this is true. Very simply, people go to see hits because they want to see that movie. They don't go to see flops because they don't want to see that movie. It's as simple as that. And the problem Hollywood has is they can't figure out why. If they could figure out why, they wouldn't give Kevin Costner... $125 million to make the postman. Studios are in business for only one very, very good reason, to stay in business, to show a profit to their stockholders. There's a quote from Michael Eisner. I'll get it wrong in one of the papers. Uh, I am not in business for art. I am business to make money for my stockholders. Absolutely correct. That's his job. He's the head of his studio. Well, is there a constant battle between art and commerce in desperately, Hollywood? Desperately, desperately. More now than ever, but now... Commerce is just killing the other guy. Right. Commerce is basically so big now. All right, I want to talk to you about movies and about writing scripts and, okay. and about the movies that you have written and, and about how difficult it is and what goes into the craft and how do you start and how fast it is and all of that. But first, take a look at this. This is a recent interview I did with uh, Roman Polanski in Paris and what he said to me about why there's so many bad movies, followed by... A little note on screenwriting by Martin Scorsese. Roll tape. And sometimes I literally stand on the set, close my eyes, and, and trying to, to remember how I was imagining that scene before the casting, before the arguing with the producers, before I, uh, talking about money, before uh, uh, hiring the actors, etc. And, and, and I, you know... 
This is part two of our conversation with William Goldman. His new book is called Which Lie Did I Tell? More Adventures in the Screen Trade. He mentioned that obituaries generally, if you have won an Oscar, will mention that as they try to recap and celebrate a life lived. Bill Goldman knows, knows that when the time comes to write his obituary, the first line will be... Academy Award winner. Oh, and the second line will be the famous phrase you wrote. Nobody knows anything. Right. That's a phrase that caught on out there. It really did. Why is that? Because, because it's true. And it came out of this book, Adventures it, in the Screen. It came out of Adventures in the Screen. It's because Hollywood is so filled with hype and lies. The fact is no one has the... Sometimes it's like fleeting uh, uh, image, you know, but the, the bit, bit, bits and pieces are there. When you're doing the film... You don't, as everybody one knows, don't do it in continuity. You do it in pieces. You just do a little piece. And there are so many elements that distract you from the, that main line that when you put it all together, it's not what it's supposed to be. Russia's always look great, even in mediocre films. Everybody's always happy. The, the, the tragic moment, it's the rough cut. When you put it all together for the first time, you know, usually the director goes to rest for a few, few weeks, couple of weeks, and leaves it with the editor to put it all together. Sometimes he goes to, you know, to a clinic. 